The Churches of Christ present Bible Talk. It's the holiday season, and with Christmas being here, I imagine that we've all done our very best to give the best gifts that we could to our loved ones. But what's the greatest gift that one could give? I give you a hint, it's not something found in any store or even found online. If you want to know what the greatest gift that you can give to your loved ones is, then stay tuned after this song of praise. Hello again, and thank you for tuning in to another episode of Bible Talk. It's with great joy that we come to you today ready to study God's Word. Thank you for choosing to be a part of this study today, and I want to personally thank you for giving me this opportunity to study God's Word with you today. I pray that you find it helpful for your spiritual well-being and spiritual growth. For weeks now, I'm sure you've seen commercials just like I have, commercial after commercial showing the greatest gifts to get your friends, your loved ones, you know, the, the year's hottest toys that are always in great demand, uh, jewelry stores offering their sales on the biggest diamonds, and, and, and gifts lists galore. I'm sure you've seen it all just like we have. And, and like many of you, I want my family, my friends, uh, my loved ones, my brothers and sisters in Christ, I want to give them all the best gifts that I could possibly give because I love them and I want them to have those things. But here's the thing. The greatest gift that I could give and the greatest gift that you could give those in your life is not something that can be ordered off of Amazon. It's not something that can be found on the shelf at Walmart or any other store or retailer. The greatest gift that you can give, in fact, is not a present at all, but rather it is your presence. What all of our friends, all of our families, all of our loved ones need is not a gift, not a present from us, but our presence in their lives. Let's notice four areas today in our study in which our presence is so greatly needed and where our presence will be the greatest gift that we could ever give to those in our lives. Those whom we love and who need our presence, they need our presence, number one today, in the Word. They need our presence in the Word of God. The Bible is emphatically clear that we are to be students of the Word. 
Now, we're students of the Word of God, number one, for our benefit. We understand that. 1 Peter 2 and verse 2, Peter said, If uh, you've tasted that the Lord is gracious, he says, uh, as uh, newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the Word, that you may grow thereby. Just like a child needs that uh, nourishment from their mother or from that formula in order to grow physically and mentally, uh, we need to grow spiritually by observing the milk of the Word of God and allowing that to cause us to grow. That's a benefit for us. In Psalm 1, the psalmist said, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. The benefit then, as the psalmist goes on in Psalm 1, is that he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. That's a benefit for us in studying God's Word. Another benefit for studying the Bible is being able to rightly divide the Word and standing approved in the sight of God. 2 Timothy 2.15, Paul said, Study or give diligence to presenting thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. Another benefit of our study of God's Word is that it helps to keep us from sin. Psalm 119 and verse 11, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And so studying God's Word is a benefit for us, yes, certainly. But it's also for the benefit of those around us. The people in our lives need our presence in the Word of God. They need our presence in the Word so that we might teach our children you know, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, we find that we're to be teaching God's Word whether we lie down, whether we rise up, whether we walk by the way, whether we're sitting in the house. That, you know, make it as frontless between your eyes. Write it upon your doorpost. But you know, before you ever get to the aspect of Moses there telling the, the Jews in Israel to teach their children, he said that you must first bind it upon your own hearts. So they need our presence in the Word of God so that we might teach them in all those occasions of life. Ephesians 6 and verse 4 says, Fathers, bring up your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. The only way for us to do that is for us to ourselves be rooted and grounded in the Word of God. We not only need to have a presence in the Word so that we might teach our children, but also so that we might teach the gospel to those that are lost and bring them to salvation. All of us have loved ones, family members, co-workers, uh, individuals whom we interact with on a daily basis who we know need the saving gospel. and We can take it to them, but we've got to know it first. Think about the Ethiopian treasurer in Acts chapter 8 who was reading and studying from Isaiah and Philip was sent to join himself to that man to teach him. And, and he comes to the uh, treasurer and he says, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I except some man should guide me? What did the Ethiopian need from Philip? He needed Philip's presence in the Scriptures so that he might expound unto him the way of the Lord more perfectly, so to speak. We need to have a presence in the Scripture so we can teach our children, so we can teach our loved ones who are lost and have not obeyed the gospel, the gospel, and bring them to salvation. We need to have a presence in the Word so that we can edify and build up the body of Christ with proper instruction. And, and I, I have to emphasize with proper instruction. There's a lot of people that are trying to build up the body of Christ and doing it contrary to the Word of God. We need to do it with proper instruction. I think about Apollos, Acts 18, verses 24 through 28, who was a good man, had good intentions, a good speaker, somebody who had a lot of zeal and was on fire for preaching. And he was doing a good job except for the fact that he knew only the baptism of John. Well, what did that evangelistic couple, that husband and wife evangelism team do? Well, they took Apollos off to the side and they taught him the way of the Lord more perfectly. And then he was able to go about doing that job even to a greater degree. See, we need a presence in God's Word so that we can edify and build up one another, the brothers and sisters in Christ in our lives, with proper instruction. And ultimately, friends, we need a presence in the Word of God to save ourselves and them. 1 Timothy 4.16, Paul told his son in the faith, young Timothy, he said, Take heed unto the doctrine and unto thyself, for in doing so you shall both save thyself and them that hear thee. Friends, they need our presence in the Word because of the power 
of the Word. The Word of God is the power to save. Romans 1 and verse 16, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it, the gospel, is the power of God unto salvation. It's in the Word of God where we find the power not only to save, but to help keep one saved. I already mentioned Psalm 119 and verse 11, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Jesus in Matthew chapter 4 resisted the advances of Satan, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life by saying each time, It is written. What is it that uh, helped him to withstand the advances of the devil? It was the gospel. It was the word of God. And so the word is the power to save. It has the power to help keep one saved. It also has the power to comfort in life's difficult times like uh, the loss of loved ones. Remember Paul said 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 18, Wherefore comfort one another with these words, the words of Scripture. And finally, friends, the Word of God has the power to bring about peace in our lives that is beyond human comprehension. Philippians 4 and verse 7, Paul wrote about the peace of God, or the peace of mind which comes from God. It passes all understanding. Friends, at the end of the day, if we have a no presence in the Word of God, then the Word will have no presence in us. We cannot expect it then to have a presence in those around us. The greatest gift that we could give to our loved ones is to have a presence in the Word. But then secondly, they need our presence in worship. The primary function of worship, of course, we understand, is to serve God. We ultimately and uh, primarily assemble together to worship in order to praise and to serve God. But at the same time in doing that, it would be foolish of us to ignore the benefits that we receive from worship. Think about the benefits afforded to us in worship. Think about edification and exhortation. Uh, Hebrews 10, 24 in 25, the Hebrews writer said, Let us consider one another to provoke and to love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Friends, it is in worship where we have the opportunity to edify each other, to build each other up, to provoke and to spur one another on to doing that which is good, and to exhort, to to warn and encourage and instruct each other. The Hebrews writer said, Do that and do it so much the more as you see the day approaching. We have an opportunity in worship not only for edification and exhortation, but as I also hinted at, with instruction. We instruct each other whenever we assemble in worship. Colossians 3 and verse 16, one of the ways we do that is through song, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. In Acts 20 and verse 7, we find that when they had assembled together on that first day, that there was preaching, there was instruction involved. You go back to Acts chapter 2, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, that instruction that takes place whenever saints assemble together. When we are present together in worship, there's not only instructions and edification and exhortation, but there's a remembrance that's made, a remembrance of the great sacrifice of our Lord on the cross of Calvary, so that you and I might have the hope of the forgiveness of our sins. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 lays out for us that great memorial of discerning the Lord's body and His blood and how we keep that memorial each day. What a wonderful way to start each week with a remembrance of what Jesus did for us. When we assemble together, when we're present in worship, there's also a sense of community, a sense of, of belonging together to a reminder that we're not in this by ourselves. Galatians 6 and verse 2, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Romans 12 and verse 15, Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Acts 4 and verse 32, Remember that those first century Christians were of one heart and of one soul. And when we come together, by being assembled together, there's love. 1 Peter 1 and verse 22, Peter said, Seeing ye have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart, fervently. Friends, when we are present together in worship, we help to provide all of those things for each other. 
in order for me to truly benefit from these wonderful blessings of assembling together with the saints, I must be present in order to receive those blessings. My absence in worship denies these things to me, but it also denies these things to my brothers and sisters in Christ whom I love. My absence also affects my family. My absence affects everyone around me because it denies them from receiving those same wonderful aspects of worship from me. Any edification that I could provide, any instruction that I could offer, any help that I might be to them and, and what they're struggling with in their lives, any love that I might be able to show them, all of that is missed when I'm not present in worship. All that's missed when you're not present in worship. Friends, in the case of parents especially, we know that absent, absence from worship can keep a child from being present in worship themselves. You know, if they see mom and dad not making worship a priority, it's only a matter of time before it's not a priority for them. Friends, the church needs, our friends need, our children need our presence in worship. With that said, it would be awfully sad if worship was the only place that we were involved or present in one another's lives. And so for that reason, number three today, we consider that our loved ones need our presence in daily involvement. The people in our lives need our presence on a regular basis, not just when the church assembles together, though they need us there. Our presence needs to be in worship. But we also need to be engaged with one another regularly. The Bible is clear that we're to love one another. I already mentioned 1 Peter 1 and verse 22. You read that great love chapter of the Bible, 1 Corinthians 13, and, and the great characteristics and attributes of love. Remember that in John 13 and verse 35, Jesus said that love is the very badge of our discipleship. He said, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples by the love that ye have one for another. Love is the badge that we wear that tells the world we are of Christ. But you know, it would be awfully difficult for me to love my wife and to show her how much I care for her if we never spend any time together. And the same is true when it comes to loving all people. It is impossible for me to truly demonstrate that love. As John said, 1 John 3 and verse 18, we don't want to love in in word and in tongue only, but in deed and in action. It's hard to do that, to carry out that statement by John without being present in one another's lives. And we need to be present on a regular basis. Now, I'm not talking about getting into people's business or being nosy or a busybody in other men's matters, but simply creating opportunities of fellowship and growth and involvement. We have a lot of those opportunities if we'll just take advantage of them. Opportunities for fellowship, get-together, special events, other things of the sort. All of these things increase our involvement, our presence with one another and therefore increases our capacity to love one another, allowing us to carry out that great command and to truly wear that badge of our discipleship. Friends, I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to be involved in each other's lives and especially for us as parents to be involved daily in the lives of our children. We need to take an interest in their interest. We need to know what it is that they're engaged with, what they're involved with. We need to take time each day to instill in them the Word of God and the importance of prayer. Be engaged with your children every day. Those around us need our presence in the work of the church daily. They need us to be involved and engaged with helping to carry out the task that God has given to us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul talks about how the church is a body. He emphasizes how every member of the body has an important role to play in, and nobody has any right to say to another member of the body, we have no need of thee because every member of the body is essential and important to the work of the church. One of the 
great things I love about Nehemiah chapter 4 as the people were rebuilding the wall of the city of Jerusalem. Nehemiah says, so built we the wall for the people had a mind to work. But you keep reading in chapter 4 and you'll find that every person took their place upon the wall. They were able to accomplish that great task in just 52 days because every person took their place on the wall. Every member has a role to play. And friends, we need your presence. Those around us need our presence in the work on a regular basis and in the work of the church. And then finally, friends, if we want to give the greatest gift we can to our loved ones, they need our presence in heaven. We understand that our lives here are not really about this life. We sing, here we are but straying pilgrims, and we sing, this world is not our home. We sing these songs understanding that there is a world to come. There is a life to come that we're ultimately preparing for. There is an eternal abode when this life is over where we're going to spend all of eternity somewhere. When it comes to eternity and this eternal home, I know that people have many questions about that life to come. You know, what are, what are we going to look like and, and all types of things. One, one of the questions that's often mentioned or sometimes asked is, Will we know who isn't there? Some might say in answering that question, well, I don't know how you wouldn't know. You know, if it's obvious that your loved one is missing, how would you not know that? And then there are some who say, well, there's no way that you could know because then you couldn't be eternally without sorrow or sadness if you knew who wasn't there. And, and, and friends, we could, we could discuss that all day today. Time's not going to permit me to dissect all of that. And I would be lying if I told you that I had all the answers concerning those questions. But here's what I want us to think about. I think the fact that the question is even asked at all is proof that your presence is needed in the world to come. I don't know how much we'll know or not know about who's there or who's not there, but the fact that we even wrestle with that question tells us that we need everybody there so that we don't even have to worry about it. Heaven is going to be heaven whether you and I make it there or not. And friends, to be honest with you, I plan to be there whether you plan to be there or not. But in truth, heaven with you sounds far sweeter than heaven without you. Friends, the greatest gift you could give your loved ones is to give them the hope and the confidence of standing around a grave knowing that you're at home with the Lord. And like David said, you may not be able to come back to them, but then that they could go to you. If you really want to give your family and your friends, your brethren, your children the greatest gift, you give them that hope. You give them the hope of knowing that you will be present in the world to come. Friends, those around you need your presence in heaven. This Christmas, I hope you can give the hot ticket items. I hope you can get the jewelry, the toys. But above all else, give your loved ones your presence. Your presence is the greatest gift that you could give. But in order to give that gift, you must first receive the greatest gift you could ever receive. And friends, the greatest gift to receive is the gift of salvation that God has offered to all of mankind, Titus 2 and verse 11. Have you accepted that gift from God? In order to accept it, you just have to believe, have faith, Hebrews 11 and verse 6. That faith then moves you to repent and change your life, Acts 17 and verse 30. We confess with our mouths that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, Romans 10, 9 and 10. And then one must be baptized, fully immersed to have their sins washed away, Acts 2 and verse 38, 1 Peter 3, 21. And when one does that, they've been added to the body of Christ. They've received then the gift of salvation. And friends, having received the greatest gift, why don't you in turn give the greatest gift to others? Give them your presence. Give them your presence in the Word of God. Give them your presence in worship. Give them your presence in daily involvement. And may we all give our loved ones our presence in heaven, the hope of the life which is to come. I pray that today you've made plans to give the greatest gift that you could possibly give. More importantly, I pray 
that if it's the case you've not received that great gift of salvation, you'd make the decision to receive it today. Thank you so much for tuning in, and God bless. Do you have any questions about the Bible? Are you searching for a place to worship God like you find in the Bible? Do you have questions about your eternity? Would you like to know more about God's plan for you? Let me encourage you to visit a Church of Christ near you today. And if you're interested in learning more about the Lord's Church, we also offer free material. For more information or if you would like to have a transcript or a copy of today's program, whether audio or video, please go to our website at www.bible-talk.org or you can email us at bible.talk at bible-talk.org You can also write to us at Bible Talk, P.O. Box 40, Fayette, Alabama, 35555. Simply include the program number and we'll be happy to send that to you completely free of charge. Thank you again for tuning in and may God bless you richly in your walk with Him.